what's happening, what's up, hold out your glass because we're about to fill it up. Welcome to the Prometheus Lens Podcast, a place where the conversations are always enlightening. We like to use the allegory of the Prometheus Lens just to take a second look at everything. I'm your host, Justin. You might know me from my works with the Dig Bible Podcast. This is my solo project. Welcome to the hero's journey. Got another great episode for you guys. Uh, Been itching to talk to this man for quite some time now. This man is really busy. He's, I'd say he does a podcast at least every other day. Everybody wants a piece of him. So we're extremely thankful that he took the time to sit down with us. So Gary, thank you for coming and sitting down and talk to us today. Well, thank you for inviting me to your show. And uh, yeah, I do stay busy, but uh, I like to schedule as many as I, uh, podcasts as I can just because I think we're in an age where People want more information and clarification on things. So really looking forward to the show tonight. Yeah. And uh, honestly, uh, I, I love hearing you talk. You're just, you're so thorough and so knowledgeable. And I relate how you say you're a contrarian because that, that, that's me. I question everything and I have to find out everything <laughs> for myself. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, it's the only way not to be totally deceived or, I mean, you know, you're going to have to rely on some people, but you better know who they are and what they're all about if you're going to go too far out on a ledge on what somebody says, something says. But as a contrarian, I'm never comfortable unless I kind of put my my own eyes on it and verified it myself because I've just seen so much misinformation, partial information, only tell you parts that they want you to know, and there's more context to it, all sorts of different things. So, um, and it can happen on the Christian side as well. So you should be a Berean or a contrarian when it comes to anything biblical as well. Uh, And that way, you know, make your own decisions. And that's what we're all trying to do. And we need to get comfortable with what we believe and where we think we are uh, in this world and why we're here. So that's what it's all about. That's right. And I use the, uh, you know, the, the allegory of the, the hero's journey, you know, you got to go off into the unknown and uh, slay the dragon, rescue the damsel. And, you know, it's just, uh, it's uh, just a journey of, of self exploration and cultivation. So we, we have to do that, especially as Christians. I, I found that, uh, we just believe everything that we're spoon fed and don't go look for ourselves. And when we do, we find a whole new world out there. You know, Genesis six is a, a prime example in the Deuteronomy 32 worldview. Grew up in church my whole yeah. life. Never heard that stuff until like maybe 2012. Yeah. Yeah. Or Psalm 82. Yeah. Or if they do, they're, they're trying to use it and define it in a completely different way. Uh, and so, the thing that doesn't happen in churches today, unfortunately, is that they don't teach the whole Bible. They don't teach prehistory and they don't teach prophecy. So they're teaching some really good things in the church, but they're not providing the larger context. And without the larger context, you only get part of the meaning. And that's when Christians get uh, become vulnerable because our, our leaders aren't doing their job. And if they're not doing their jobs, then we need to start educating ourselves because, you know, if we are in the fig tree generation, as I think that we might be, then the, where the church is today and where they're going, so even if it was another generation down the road, that just means Christians will be even more uh, vulnerable and, and not prepared the way they ought to be because if we don't understand prehistory we can't understand prophecy Mm. and we can't imagine what's coming that's the thing that is going to just totally test the faith of the saints is what's going to be coming at us and that every time we think it is we can't see anything more that's unimaginable we're going to see more And so it's going to it's going to shake Christians right down to the core of their faith, and they're either going to have the armor of God on, and they're going to provide the testimony of Jesus Christ, or or, or we're not. Um, and but you you know if you're still around, uh, you will get one chance to come out of Babylon at that point, yeah. <laughs> and then and then you really have to earn your way in the hard yeah. way. Yeah, and, that, and that's definitely a lesson if you can avoid learning the hard way you want to. 
or at least I do. Yeah. <laughs> I learned a lot of things the hard way, but that's not one thing I want to learn the hard way. Yeah. Well, uh, for those that's not followed your work or are real familiar, uh, tell us how you got into uh, your, your studies and, and your deep dives to, to tell the listeners that's not familiar about your, your dare. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's really what it was. And if I wasn't so, let's say, hubris at the time and so young and feeling and, you know, like you can, nothing can stop you from doing anything that you want to do. I was maybe 20 or 21 years old and uh, it was a Friday night and my brother was there and he had brought a friend and I'd not met the friend before, but they had come fairly close and we started having beers and into the evening one of them uh, says to me, uh, you know, how, how brave are you? Like, how much courage do you have? And I'm going, yeah, I'm pretty brave. I'm, <laughs> you know, what do you got in mind? I didn't know whether it was going to be a wrestling contest or, you know, but it was a dare to read a book if I had the courage. And so I had no idea what book they might be talking about, although they were talking about false prophet and antichrist. And I wasn't really all that familiar with that, except from sort of the 1970s movies. So, um, so I thought, well, it's got to be related to that, but I don't know what they're going to ask. So I thought maybe the Bible. But what they said is you need to read this book by a fellow by the name of Hal Lindsey, who wrote The Late Great Planet Earth. And he... He was big time into prophecy and way ahead of his time. And as time goes on, I mean, he's not, wasn't right on everything, but nobody is. Um, but he was like 90% bang on, I think. And, you know, from that point in time with so little knowledge that was out there, it was sort of revolutionary and it scared the socks off of me. And so much so that I wanted to verify whether or not he was being accurate because, uh, you know, pretty important stuff. I would say, <laughs> yeah, it's pretty important stuff if it's true. But on the flip side of it was, is in particularly in the '80s, where you had all of these televan televangelical shows on television that were raising money, and there was a lot of charlatans in there, and they they would misquote scripture and do all sorts of different things, and it was just more about how much money that they could raise, and you didn't know who was being truthful or not, or who was manipulating scripture. So, you know, it's pretty easy to go to the Bible and look up the passages that he's talking about, but what it's not easy to do is, is to, to have the ability to discern whether or not he was quoting it in context. As a podcast editor, I know what it's like for long nights, and sitting at the computer, and your eyes just start to go down, you're nodding out, trying your best to finish your workload. You can slam down a bunch of monsters and Red Bull and slowly kill yourself. Or you can go with God's Nectar. Kevlar Joe's Coffee Company. They're a proud sponsor of the show. Check those guys out. Many times I uh, drink me some of that Flatline Joe. Perks me up, man. Gets me going. Without all the jitters. and Helps me power through your projects. So, Help support the show, help support a brother in Christ and a small business owner with Kevlar Joe's Coffee Company. And was he quoting accurately with what other passages said? And how does the whole story sort of fit? And so the only way I could do that was to start reading the Bible. And so I read the Bible first and then I decided there's just so much in here and I, I missed half of it. And so I thought I will... Uh, try and document all the different prophetic narratives. And so I started doing highlighters. I ran out of highlighters pretty quick, so I'd start over. So then I started to create files, and then I realized I need even more files because people don't realize that the Bible is literally about a third prophetic. And some people say even more, depending on how, they, you know, how far back they want to go to put that, those prophecies in. And so as I started logging it all, I ran across Genesis 6 very early on, right? And when I first read it, I just said, you know what? I have no idea what that's all about. That is just crazy stuff. I'm not ready for that. And I'm just going to ignore it because that's not what I'm here to do. And so when I went through and I logged everything through the Bible and I realized I needed to do it again to make sure that I had had it all and I learned again, I would have to do it several times uh, because you just don't recognize all the different prophecy lanes. I thought 
because these giants came up before the flood, because these giants started to show up after the flood, because there's demons, because there's evil spirits, there's the angelic realm, they're kind of seemingly connected to the end time, I'm going to log the passages about the giants. And of course, I didn't get that all done the first time either, because you don't recognize some of the giant names that aren't specifically listed as, as, as giants. So that's how I got into it. So I spent from about, say, 1981 to about 1996 or so just doing that. And then I thought, I've got... And, and as I started in the late 80s, I started to use a typewriter and I started to make uh, collecting these various passages and putting them into some sort of narrative just so that I could sort of follow it because you get so much information, you get lost in the information. And I thought, I got a lot of books here I could write, but I've never written a book. Uh, I, uh, you know, I, I did not go to university. Um, and I did not go to seminary school, and I wasn't a minister. I had no basis for why uh, I should be writing this book other than I felt I had to do this. And so I thought, well, what am I going to do first? I have to figure out whether or not I can get published. And if I could get published, would people buy the book? And would they read the book? Right. <laughs> and would there be enough interest uh, to, to sort of continue? So my plan was... To write a simple book, a short book. And, what happened there, Gary? And somewhere along, as the story goes, the idiom goes, along the road to the Colosseum, <laughs> things happen. So I thought I would connect very quickly Genesis 6 with Revelation and just sort of show some connections in there. I thought that would be kind of unique and easy to do. And I wrote the first 10 chapters pretty fast. But when I was growing up, I was very much a history buff. Mm -hmm and a mythology buff. So I understood that there was many parallel stories to the Nephilim and the Raphaim in the Bible, but they were told through polytheist cultures and a polytheist lens. That was essentially what I saw as the difference. So one, you know, Genesis 6 creation of giants is from a monotheist perspective or the God of the Bible and uh, the tripart nature. And the other one is through the pantheon of gods. And, there, and all the other examples around the world are the polytheist version. So they're recording these events, either what was in the Bible or their own parallel records um, that was just uh, going to show their culture. And then I thought, well, I can put in there about Gilgamesh and I can put in there about the Anunnaki and the giants and the heroes and Greek mythology, but... And it'll show some validity that this is not a story that's left out on its own. But I'm not giving any context for Christians. And so although I'm trying to reach out to other uh, belief systems and cultures in the first book, um, my book is targeted more towards Christians, but I'm trying to show people connections uh, in, in, in prehistory and in, in, in prophecy. And so I thought I needed to learn about their religions because the religion is such a big part of the culture. It was essentially the culture with their yeah. gods. So then I had to learn, read various scriptures all around the world, you know, right from the Popol Vuh to the Vedas and everything in between um, and all the Gnostic Gospels. And so that took me quite a while. And then I thought... As I did that, there's this development of this knowledge that's being talked about within the mystery schools that is going to be part of the knowledge that the gods are going to provide them. And I thought, well, I better learn about mystery schools. And so as I get into mystery schools, then I find out they're directly connected to secret societies. And the secret societies take their beginnings back to before the flood, mm -hmm back to the seven sacred sciences that are developed in the mystery schools as an extension of the mystery religion. And they're developing disciplines of those seven sacred sciences. And then I thought, well, I don't know anything about secret societies. <laughs> so then I thought, well, I better learn a little bit about secret societies. Like, how much could there be to learn? And you have no idea until you start digging into it how 
many secret societies there are there are and not just in europe and north america all over the world yeah. well just with us you and, know, you albert pike's morals and dogma i bought that and yeah. started digging through that and i mean i'm like two months into it and i'm maybe that far into it because i have to stop and take so many notes there's just so much there to yeah. chew on yeah and so i had to figure out how to put all of that kind of information in context so uh with what they're telling of their story of the prehistory of the flood creation of humans creation of the world creation of giants and after the flood so and then throw that into the idea well the secret societies are connected into this and so it turns into a bit of a conspiracy book because of their grand plan in their end time uh, that begat in prehistory and so I didn't get the book finished till about 2013, and then I continued to sort of write and, and do research as I was doing it. I got it published technically uh, in December of 2015, but more like 2016, as, as I recall. So um, that was how long it took to get there. And I took, to get it published, I took over 300 pages out. So uh it's still 800 page book and there's over 100 pages of footnotes because they're end notes and i wanted people to know where my sources were because that's one of the things i also found is that you think that the the uh, the, the writer is relying on sources but you're not given much for the sourcing in the end notes and, and, and it's really hard to verify it so i want wanted people to verify what i learned if they want to go look it up go look it up and so and I said I would never write a sequel to the Genesis 6 conspiracy. And I started another book. I'm 300 pages into another book. And, but people are contacting me and saying, we really like this book. It connects more dots than what we've ever seen before. But we want something that goes deeper into the Bible. We want you to do something that's not been done before. So I'm thinking, well, I don't want to be redundant, right? Because... Mm -hmm. I cover a lot of material in the first book, so I had to, it took a lot of time to come around and listen and uh, and to be you know led to be able to sort of say this is this book comes first, and now I see after finishing the second book, I see well, how I need to change the other book I was on to to make it work better. So there'll be an, a third book, but it won't be the Genesis 6 conspiracy in this sort of format. So this book that I've got coming out in, in October or November, it's the Genesis 6 conspiracy part two, specifically targeted at Christians. And the subtitle is how uh, understanding prehistory and giants helps to define end time prophecy. Because you need that for the context. Any right? good story, if you don't so, know the beginning, you, you ain't gonna understand the ending. Yeah, so in the new book, and just to throw a quick uh, sort of blurb about that, is that it's specifically targeted at Christians. It goes deeper into giants than anybody has ever done before. Uh, it is going to be just as unique as the first book. It has some overlap with the first book, um, but only to sort of not lose the reader, right? They have to have some context. Are and you saying we got some last 300 pages back? There's a little bit of that in there. Um, <laughs> so this one goes really deep into all the giants, all the giant nations' names. I'm going to cover off all of the giant wars after the flood, all the different campaigns, all the way through to King Solomon and a little bit beyond. And I'm going to cover off the angelic hierarchy uh, that includes the visible ones and the in invisible ones, so the demonic spirits and all their other creations that they've created both before and after the flood. And I'm going to give you that hierarchical order that I, I reset from um, the standard sort of dogma that is out there that's been carried because it just doesn't make any sense when I dug into Dionysus how or Dionysius how he uh, had put it out. It was pretty good, but the words don't always match up with the New Testament names, and the New Testament names aren't always consistent unless you take it back to the Greek, and that. You've got archangels that are around the throne, and they're not part of the watchers. And I'm going, wait a minute, that makes no sense to me. So I rearrange it for people. And uh, then I start to bridge all of that by highlighting things that they need to know for end-time prophecy 
and then I'll walk people into uh, the, the end time prophecy aspect. You can't cover it all, but I'll lay my format down in terms of, of my approach. I explain it in the preface and it's a very high standard and it just simplifies things for people. And then I show how that flows and how all of that imagery and allegory is all the, there for you to understand from prehistory to put into the end time. And just so that people know, I know there's a lot of different approaches on eschatology. I don't fall into any one of them. I, it probably overlaps on a number of them. I, I just do some things that I think make a little bit more sense for people. Yeah. Well, see, with me, um, eschatology is like how I like to, to do my study. You know, yeah. you, you got to know how to, you know, I hate to be cliche, but eat the meat and spit out the bones. You know what I mean? You yeah. got to pick, you know, a piece from here, a piece from there, and inform your ideology. Yeah. The, the thing I don't like about preconceived eschatology which all the other approaches mm -hmm. are. They ha they start with a seemingly a preconceived conclusion and then try and manipulate Bible and like a pretzel to fit their belief. And if they can't do that, then they just ignore them. Or make message. stuff so, up. <laughs> or make stuff up, yeah. Or I'm a prophet, yeah. right? And I've been given this, and that's why, you know, it's, it's not in the Bible. And so... So I don't leave out the inconvenient passages. I don't uh, try and manipulate Scripture. It, it's all got to fit. It's all got to fit perfectly. And anybody ought to be able to do it. It just takes the time and the work to do it. But the key is that I think separates me, and I know people say they do this, but I do it a little bit differently. Um, I don't put prophecy, I don't put what Jesus said about prophecy around what the other prophets said, or define that. I put all prophecy around what Jesus said, period. The other guys were me. And people, yeah, exactly. They, they are adding to what he, he what uh, Jesus' template is that you get in Matthew 24. And if you don't think it's a, a chronological template, it starts with uh, him going then, that word then, and you take that back to Greek, and it's the Greek word toda. It means exactly that. You get the chronology, and then you get the midpoint with the abomination that he references the book of Daniel for you to, to read about, so you understand what that event is and when it happens. And then you get the events after the abomination. And people say you can't put Revelation against Jesus' template. Well, that makes no sense. Of course you can. And in fact, it has to go exactly against what Jesus said, or over top of what Jesus said, because it's the testimony of Jesus Christ that an angel is presenting for Jesus to John. It has to fit. There cannot be conflict. There cannot be contradiction. He's not a God so of confusion. My per yeah, so then once you do that, once you understand that he's giving you the template, all the conflicts and contradictions go away. You don't have to be afraid of any passages. Well, Gary, uh, it's definitely a, a linguistic archaeology, and I, I thank you for taking the time to do that. Everybody gets caught up on Indiana Jones, you know, swinging from the vine yeah. and stealing the, the golden yeah. goblet, and but they don't yeah. see the other 90% of him in the library reading the books to find these places and to be able to do these things. Yes. Yep. But uh, I, before we get started on our subject matter, I, I do want to ask you this, and if, and if you don't want to answer this, that's that's perfectly fine, but... I've never really heard anybody ask you about uh, your your faith journey and your personal uh, relationship. Like, that. were you always raised in church, or was you brought to Christ later in life? Would you mind to share that? Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, I was uh, baptized United in Canada, raised in a Baptist church till about twelve or thirteen years old, and you know, as you get into the secular um, education and the peers that you're friends with, um, I kind of left, I left the church. I left God. I went with evolution, went with science, and uh, didn't really question it. I just thought, you know what, this just seems to make more sense, and I didn't know why it made more sense, which is, uh, you know, a mistake right out of the gate. So by the time I had this dare, I mean, I was clearly you, brainwashed. Full rebellion, huh? For rebellion, absolutely. So it's not that my journey turned with a light switch and I was instantly converted. 
Um, and I, it, it took a long time because I wanted to be sure if I was going to overturn everything, I wanted to understand what I was overturning and why. And could I answer questions that most people can't answer? And yes, you have to have faith, but I think God probably provided us enough knowledge that we can have both understanding and faith. And there are things that, you know, we're not going to know. Not even the angels knew everything. Otherwise, they wouldn't have crucified Jesus, as the book of Corinthians mm -hmm. talks about. But there's more knowledge that we can have and that we can make logical arguments to the seculars. And because I had argued so vehemently for the other side in terms of, you know, no God and evolution and stuff like that, I understood the arguments. And then the light started to go on in terms of the holes in their arguments. And it was like Swiss cheese once, you, once the light goes on. And so it was that sort of struggle back. And then, you know, when I start on this project, I, you know, I'm, I'm thinking I, I'm, 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 I'm there and I'm, I'm in and I'm, um, you just had your toe in the, in the deep end, didn't you? <laughs> I did. And I, 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 when I got into all the different things that I got into, I had to, it challenged my faith all the way through. And, you know, were they right? And this was different than what we were taught at school. So now there was the three options. So, but now I'm looking at this other belief system that's essentially the same religion around the world. That's all polytheism, all comes from the original pantheon. And uh, when I started to put all of this stuff together, it's like, I have to be crazy. Nobody's going to believe this. And people are going to think I'm a madman. And it's like, so I, I left the project stone cold many times and I write about that in, in the preface but you know God's pretty patient <laughs> I don't know why he can be so patient um, but he was very patient with me and so even though I would leave it there was always this as I describe it in my preface this calling that's sort of in the wilderness that's drawing me back and I don't want to go back I, 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 I've had enough and I had to be drawn back in many, many times. And uh, so that was a real sort of process. And then, you know, when, when I published the book, now you're going to be out in the public arena. And uh, if, you're, you're, if you're not ready for that, uh, then, you know, it, it can be a tough road. So I was sort of surprised a few times uh, never disheartened, but I was surprised at the resistance to the information. Nobody ever said he, he doesn't have sources for it or that he was lying. They just reject it without an argument. I'm going, that sounds a lot like the seculars to yeah. me. <laughs> it's dogmatic. I mean, if you look at it, it's the, the living yeah. embodiment of the allegory of the cave. Yeah. So that was a long process that was, is the short answer. So, and, uh, but you know, you learn through it as well is that you have to be, you have to choose every day to be Christian. It's a lifestyle. You just don't, you just don't choose once. You got, it's a perpetual thing. You always have to choose. And the whole world is trying to get you to choose otherwise. Yes. Well, Gary, thank you for sharing that with me. And, uh, but one thing, uh, I'm just like you. I, I loved history. I loved the the epics, and I loved the mythology. Uh, just recently, I spoke with uh, Luis Marcos that wrote uh, the Myth Made Fact, and we talked about all the the Greek mythology and the with a Christian perspective. Yep. And it was I really enjoyed that. But I overheard you, and I've heard you say it, you know, at least a, a handful of times on other podcasts that. Uh, one of your favorite epics is the Epic of Gilgamesh. And that was, you know, one of my favorites too. And I was like, and if you have spoke on it on a podcast, I've missed it. But I was like, I want to talk to Gary yeah. about the Epic of yeah. Gilgamesh. Yeah, it's been a few years since I've spoken on uh, the Epic of Gilgamesh. Um, but it was, uh, I did speak a fair bit in, in the early going, um, but uh, not lately. So, and it's, to me, it's one of those topics that if you have the armor of God on, 
you have nothing to fear, yeah. but it's going to give you some more context about what you, you know you should know if you've read the whole Bible. And, and what I mean by that is, is that if you're not leaving out specific aspects of, of, of the Bible, so it will make it will make sense to you. And I tell people all the time too. I've mentioned it on a, our other show, the Dig Bible Podcast, and we talked with uh, Timothy Alberino, and he worded it really well. We we asked him, you know, in his opinion, how important is it that Christians dig into the Bible? And he said, "Oh, it's extremely important." He said, "But only if you." Uh, have a firm foundation in Christ. He said, if you know the historicity of Christ can defend the historic Jesus Christ and why you believe yep. what you believe, then you can go digging. He said, because if you don't have that foundation, he said, between TikTok, YouTube, and all these deceptions out there, you can be easily led astray. Yes. Yeah. Very important. Well, with the Epic of Gilgamesh, uh, What's your your take on it and the overall theme and messages with it? Which I know that's an onion; it's got many layers. But I I want to hear your side. Yeah. Well, I want to do something today uh, when I talk about the Epic of Gilgamesh that I didn't do in the beginning. And one of the things that, if you want to understand prehistory. Uh, around the world and in the Bible, you need to understand uh, the reigns of the gods. Are you a member of the Prometheus Lens Podcast members only group? And if not, what are you waiting for? Come join the band of brothers on the hero's journey. With this members only package, you get early access to episodes. You get special episodes that nobody else gets, special video content, documentaries, and you help support the show and keep the lights on. You know, doing podcasts, they can be very expensive. A lot of people don't realize all the subscriptions, the website fees, the, the video and audio subscriptions and things like that. So if you enjoy the content, help keep the lights on, help me keep doing what I love to do and keep bringing you fire each and every week. And there's two major rains. There's one before the flood and there's one after the flood. So... This is known as the parent gods before the flood and the offspring gods reigning after the flood. So to describe that would be if I said uh, Zeus is a god of Olympus but is a post-Diluvian god. And he, and he produces Hercules through alchemy of human female after the flood. His father is Uranus who reigned with um, the parent gods like Gaia before the flood, who also created giants. And uh, it's important to understand that this is a common doctrine around the world that the offspring gods, they overthrow the parent gods and kill them. Well, you can't kill somebody that's immortal. These are fallen angels. They are immortal. Uh, however, God is going to destroy them. If he wants to destroy them, that's the power of God. But our understanding is they're going to burn forever in the lake of fire because they're immortal beings, the fallen ones. So all that's going on here is, is that if you want to understand and not conflate history, you have to understand that the parent gods, like Uranus, went to the abyss for creating the original Nephilim before the flood. And so if we put that into the biblical context, you have El and the Baalim. El is a parent god. He's the father of Baal. And he created giants too, but before the flood. And Baal creates the Raphaim after the flood, along with his Baalim. And so that's the first thing that we need to keep in mind, is that there are going to be stories that are going to be overlaid onto the offspring gods because they inherit those positions. They have their own rebellious host, as, you, as we were talking about earlier, and these are the ones that rule over the 70 nations in Deuteronomy 32 mm -hmm. and are in the council of the gods in Psalms 82 that Satan sits over. And so these uh, fallen angels, um, after the flood, 
if they cr did the same crimes as the angels that did before the flood, they disappear and they go to the abyss as well, to the pit prison. And that's why in the Ugaritic texts, they're doing fertility rituals to bring Baal and Ashtaroth and the Baalim back to create more Rephaim because they have a fertility issue after the flood. So understanding that will help you that they're going to inherit all of the stories. So when you hear Poseidon, for example, being the god who creates the giants through Clido, um, with the Atlantis story, and Atlantis is, is, is destroyed by a flood, understand that Poseidon, he creates giants after the flood as well, but he's inheriting the parent god's mythos for replacing him. And so that was Iapetus, who was the part of the Uranus Gaius hierarchy of angels, and that Iapetus uh, had married um, a human female and married many others as well, but one of the ones for the names that we get is Climene, and he produced gods, uh, giants like Gog, as in Gog of Magog. Magog in Ezekiel 38 and 39 in Revelation 20, Magog as well, and Albion, and many other giants. But I like how and, Derek uh, Gilbert explains that. He, he says that he, he gives his wife credit for it. He said, but basically, if you got five finger puppets on one hand, they might yep. have all different faces and different names, but it's the same hand. Yep. You know, just like yep. Utu, you know, Samash yep. is Ishtar, is yep. Anana, you know, it's, 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 it's the same pantheon all around yes. the world. They just have different vernacular names and they're doing, they're, they're worshiping the same gods and the same religion. And so you have uh, this host that's the Hebrew word Saba. And it means an army, an army of angels. So anytime you have, like before the flood, where you have the ones who procreated and violated the laws of creation and other violations were sent to the abyss, other angels would rise up and rank in order to replace them. That's what the offspring gods do. So when the offspring gods who took over do the same crimes and also go to the abyss because they don't walk among us anymore, then they were uh, succeeded by other people within that army. So we have to be careful on how we connect uh, events to post-Diluvian gods with antediluvian gods. And that with the giants, a lot of the giants after the flood were named for giants that were created before the flood. I think Hercules and Heracles is one of those things. As we're talking about the Epic of Gilgamesh, people might be familiar with the Enoch Book of Giants. And uh, he is mentioned in that on um, 4Q 530, 531, and 534, as I recall. And this is the giants who are afraid of the flood coming. And you have a Gilgamesh that's named. And he's going to go to Enoch for help. This is going to be Enoch, son of Cain, not Enoch, son of Jared, because Enoch, son of Jared, is already in heaven. And uh, to see whether there's anything they can do to prevent this disaster from coming. And, of course, they're told they're not. And then he's going to actually try and go into heaven like an Antichrist figure and uh, try and uh, defeat God. Um, and actually battles with some of the starry host as, as you get some of the uh, bits and pieces out of the uh, Enoch Book of Giants. Well... Eno, uh, Gilgamesh, in the Epic of Gilgamesh, is the son of a king of Uruk named Lugal Banda. And he's going to be a giant as well, um, but he's also is the son of the mother, which is the fertility goddess Nin, or Nin Sen, as it's uh, transliterated in some of the epics. And so he's two-thirds god and one-third human, and Gilgamesh is sixth generation after the flood, so after Nimrod. And so he is created after the flood. But he's named with the same name as a giant before the flood. 
So what we don't know is, is are they attributing this mythos to a giant to create his kingship imagery, because he's the king of Uruk as well, and inheriting that, and it's this is to be attributed to an, the other Enoch that's mentioned in the Book of Giants, or is this a post-Diluvian story? I suggest it could be either, but I lean more towards this is another giant named Gilgamesh and is inheriting that mythos just like the offspring gods would inherit that mythos. So what's interesting about the Epic of Gilgamesh as well is, is he has another uh, giant that he's going to become friends with who was created in the same way and is also two-thirds God, one-third human, and his name is Enkidu in Akkadon in some of the transliterations. And he's to offset the tyrant nature of Gilgamesh, because he's so evil. Uh, but they become friends. Um, Which I always see it now, as, like later when on, you call it um, cultured man versus uh, uncivilized man, you know? Yeah. Yeah, that's another analogy of it. Yeah, yeah absolutely. So, now what's also interesting about the Epic of Gilgamesh is, is that epic is dated to about 2150, a few dates vary this way or that way, but it's based on even older uh, stories and legends, and they don't have where they don't have such a complete uh, accounting as in the ones that uh, you know are in the twelve tablets that people would sort of understand. But I understand there's older versions, just they're not as complete. And so a lot of people will say that the Epic of Gilgamesh is the story that the book of Genesis was based on, and that it was plagiarized from the Epic of Gilgamesh. And for Christians, we ought not to run away from things. We ought to take the arguments on, but they've trained us not to take on their challenges, that if it doesn't come to mind instantly, they just create bigger and bigger wedges. So. Of course, the Epic of Gilgamesh would be older than the account of Genesis as it comes down to us because Genesis is provided in the Torah to Moses about 1400 BC. So it has to be, this account has to be older. That doesn't mean people didn't know about the flood before Israel. I mean, it's in all cultures around the world, in all continents. So the Epic of Gilgamesh is either a polytheist version um, or it is a corruption of a monotheist tradition that comes down after the flood. So you can, you can look at it either way. I mean, and I'm fine either way. And what's also interesting about the Epic of Gilgamesh is that it has the flood story, yeah. uh, which could be an addition mm -hmm. to the Epic of Gilgamesh, to, uh, to the story as, as you could make a good argument for over top of the old one. Um, so in as you get later on into the, uh, the Epic of Gilgamesh on Tablet 11 uh, and beginning in, in Tablet 10, he's going to look for Atmat Pishtun or Zayazudra, and there's a few other different names and different transliterations of the same story. He's going to look for Atmat Pishtun, who is the Sumerian Noah, as they like mm -hmm. to call him and that this is what the Noah story is based on. And so on the macro side of the story, it's talking a very similar story. But on the micro level, on the detail side, it's a completely different story. So it's talking about the same event. So again, it's, it's either it's perspective. corruption of the monotheist one or it's a polytheist version, right? And so Upmatishtin is also two-thirds God and one-third human. And he's the ultimate Nephilim from before the flood. And so is all of his family. And they're provided an ark versus building the ark. And so you see that corruption in the last Noah movie uh, where the angels were building the ark for Noah. Yeah, these big stone um, giants. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and... Yeah, so obviously that's a Gnostic corruption of the story that was in the, in the last movie. Um, and so 
his whole family is two thirds God and one third human. And, and they're the ones that are the archetypical Nephilim to, and the terrible ones that are to repopulate the earth afterwards. And we need to understand that around the world, there are giant stories, survival stories, and there are human survival stories. And they're not necessarily um, incongruent with each other. We don't know how giants survived the flood. I lean heavily towards second incursion, and we get that in the Epic of Gil Gilgamesh, but we get both second incursion and survival. And so we have to be open to the idea that maybe some giants survived the flood and there seems to be a second incursion as well. Although I, I still think it fits better with second incursion. There's a couple other ways. I won't go through all the buckets unless you want me to in terms of how giants show up after the flood. You can make a legal argument though from the Bible to suggest how uh, Pishtun would be a real giant after the flood that Gilgamesh is seeking out because in Genesis 6 and in Genesis 7 when you look at what God is doing he is going to destroy everything he created on the earth. He did not create the giants. He was also Alpha Omega so he knew just giving humankind a second chance to ensure the names of the Book of Life were fulfilled and that the grand plan would be fulfilled with the coming of the Messiah and the resurrection. Well, even the context in that, Genesis 6, where it says the word when, you know, when they came into yeah. the daughters of men. So, I mean, that's, that's you know, I mean, yeah. future from that point on. You could interpret it that, but we don't get that verse after mm -hmm. the flood. So, like I said, I will use that for my defense of second incursion, but because you can have a legal argument in Genesis 6 and Genesis 7 about the beings that were to be totally destroyed, um, and it was basically starting anew and all of the corruption, um, one presumes that uh, you could make a, you could find a way to say, okay, God didn't create the giants, the fallen angels did, so that's the legal rule and the legalism why the angels stepped in, the fallen angels, to save some of their brethren, right? They're not their brethren, but their spurious offspring as their godfathers. But, like I say, that you can make that argument, but it's kind of a thin argument. So. I'm open to the idea, I just don't become dogmatic on second incursion, but I'm open to the idea that somehow there was another way. Um, and I'll walk through um, how the Canaanites are connected to the giants in, in the second book. And then that's connected to the Raphaim or the second incursion giants. But um, So anyways, in, the, in this uh, epic, we also get a parallel one that's in the Greek mythology with Deucalion and Pyrrha, also called the Greek Noah and the Greek Noah's wife. And uh, again, this is not the same story. Deucalion is the son of Prometheus. And That's a good segue. Prometheus is a, it, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's a god, right? He's another demigod. He's another giant. So there's no way that that is going to be a human survival story. So understand that the polytheists have their versions as to how giants show up after the flood. What's interesting is though in the Greeks they also talk about um, two groups of giants. One that was wiped out with the flood and then the second group that was created. So they also talk about um, a second incursion as well, but then they also talk about Deucalion and Pyrrha, so they seem to have both as well. So they seem to be hedging it, and it could be that it might be why we see a bit of a distinction in some of the the giants uh, after the flood, if there is a survival. And again, I think it's just different angels that are recreating it, but Gilgamesh is a dark-haired giant with a big bushy beard and Nimrod is depicted just like him and Gilgamesh is going to inherit one of the cities that Nimrod renovated because these are antediluvian cities 
uh, that Nimrod is, and I'm talking about Erech as it's said in the Bible, or Aruk as we would understand it in the secular but side. But you're stretching me right now, Gary, and I like it. You, you're yep. making me think yep. because I was always in the camp, and I've heard other people talk that I have respected and uh, just kind of went along with it and done a little bit of digging, but it's just kind of surface stuff. But it's like I'd always heard that, Basically, the finger puppet thing that we talked about earlier, you know, that Gilgamesh yeah. was another name for Nimrod and that uh, Nimrod slash Gilgamesh was in Merkur from the Sumerians Kings list. Yeah. So it's kind of like I always seen them yeah. as interwoven. So I've not thought about the whole yeah. adopting the, the lineage to get prestige, yeah. you know. So the. If you, if you look at the king's list, it goes like this after the flood. And so you have Atma Pishten, who's the head king at the time of the flood. And so he becomes the first generation after the flood. Then you have um, Meski Agashur. Um, and then you have a fellow by the name of Enmarakar. That's third generation. Same generation as Nimrod. Uh, Enmarakar seems to be the root for Nimrod. Um, as as the king, and then you have Lugal uh, Lugal Banda, uh, or, or, I'm sorry, Dum Zeil, and then Lugal Banda, and then Gilgamesh um, that are that are ruling Uruk as well. So he is sixth generation, according to those records. Now he's also connected into the Ugaritic texts, and most people don't know this. That not only do you have the Sumerian versions, but you have the Ugaritic text version that make note of this extraordinary giant named Gilgamesh. And it's the same story as in the Sumerian text. Is he sixth in line in that one also? Um, well, it's, again, we get a lot of really weird dating on the uh, Ugaritic text, and they're moving it about 600 years forward. And um, that's the same problem in Greek history, and that's why things sort of get out, out of whack. Um, so, um, when we look at uh, Gilgamesh um, I, I, and, and the Ugaritic text, it makes more sense that this would be immediately after the flood because the Raphaim are created. They're the Rapiu or the Rapiyam um, that are created and they have a fertility issue and that Baal and the Baalim will disappear shortly after the flood as well. For the same crimes. And so I'm thinking the Ugaritic texts, you know, where they'll date that starting at about 15 or 1600 BC, I'm going to move that back to more like 2200, 2300 BC. Uh, and it just starts to make more sense as you look at other events in the Bible, it just sort of starts to intersect. And if you take like the, uh, you know, the story of Troy, which is 12, 1300 BC, which is usually sort of uh, estimated at. Uh, I did a show with some Greek historians and stuff and they're saying, we, we got a 600 year gap with the rest of the world. We don't get it. That 600 years goes back to the same secular dating of the flood to about, you know, 3000 or 3050 BC. Some people say as low as 2950. Move that 600 years, you get the dating of the flood. It's the same 600-year mystery that, that confuses people, in my opinion. That's my, how I, I sort of uh, get around it. So, you know, I wouldn't put Gilgamesh uh, at the same dating as, you know, 2650 B.C. or so, 2600. I would move him down to more like 2300. Uh, and then things really start to sort of line up, particularly when in, you get into the giant war of, of Genesis 14 and the time of Abraham. Just everything starts. And that's to what sink. I was about to say. A lot of people so, missed Lugabanda was one of those five kings. Yeah. Yeah. So you have uh, in the Ugaritic text, you have an accounting of him that is identical to the Sumerian text, and he uh, is not like the other giants. And he's bigger than the Raphaim. Um, and we don't know how much bigger. The only Raphaim that we could sort of measure biblically would be Og and uh, 
Goliath, and Goliath is 400 years after Og, but Og is the last of the giants, the last of the Raphaim, where it says giant there, that's Raphaim. Nephilim is only used three times for giant in the Old Testament, and that's twice in Numbers 13, 33, when they're trying to create the Anakim to be Nephilim, when they're accounted for as Raphaim in Deuteronomy 2 for giant, and one time in Genesis 6. 25 times Raphaim is used in the Old Testament. Um, and it's only translated as a tribe twice, which is Genesis 14 and, and Genesis 15. And, you know, and with Genesis 15, where the lands are being awarded to, to Abraham. He's part, they're part of the mighty ten, as I like to call them, that are listed there. And so you have the Raphaim that are t more tending to be blonde-haired, blue eyes, and red hair, and hazel eyes with, hazel, with, with pale skin. Versus the Indo-Aryan and the Aryans that produced the dynastic line of the Persian kings that they took their genealogies back to in that sort of model, or the Syrian kings, or with like Gilgamesh. So Nimrod was son of Cush, so he's not really part of that line. He, I think he um, marries into... Uh, giants after the flood and creates hybrid dynasties and gets conflated uh, with that sort of depictions. But typically when they're showing um, uh, Nimrod pictures, those are Gilgamesh pictures mm. or other Anunnaki after the flood, earthly Anunnaki. And so Goliath is part of four brothers of a giant, Rapha, Raphaim. And he is six cubits and a span. So he's the king of Gath that Ashish is going to uh, take his uh, take over afterwards. And Josephus said we you should measure the giants on the royal cubit because they're all royals, essentially is what he's saying. And so on a royal cubit, Goliath would be 11 feet, 3 inches tall. On a standard cubit, he'd be 9 feet, 9 inches tall. Either way, he's a giant. Um, but I think 11 inches would fit better. King Og, labeled as a king, he had a bed that was uh, 9 cubits long and 4 cubits wide. So that's on a royal cubit, that would be 7 feet wide. And almost 16 feet long. Yeah, I'll make a joke. I'm like, yeah, either he was really tall or he had a lot of concubines. <laughs> that's yeah, a big well, <laughs> that's a big bed. And, that, and it had to be made of iron because wood would not support yeah. his weight. Because these giants were, just as you have a two-to-one proportion there, they're thought to be that sort of proportion with most of the giants. So they were called, they're called stout in the King James Version Bible, just as Azaz and Azaz, the root for Azazel, which is uh, describing mighty ones uh, in, in, as we get it translated into uh, English in the King James Version Bible, will mean stout. Not stout as in fat, as in stocky, muscular, wide. So their standard human height to width ratio was three to one. And look at Saul, Versus you know. Two to one to Saul the Saul was scared to yeah. death of this man, wouldn't face him. And Saul is depicted yeah. as being like the other kings that were giants. It said that he was a head, yeah. uh, what was it, head and shoulder taller than the average man. So people yes. try to de-supernaturalize yes. the Bible and say, oh, well, he was just a little bit taller, you know, the average height was five foot five. So, you know, Saul was yeah. probably six foot, maybe six five. And it's like for yeah. him to be terrified and not go after and want to fight yeah. Goliath. I mean, that, yeah. you know, the latter would make a lot that more sense. Something. Yeah. Yeah. And he was, he was made king to make war with the giants and the hybrid giants. Yeah. But Goliath scared him that, scared him that much. And 12 foot is, is, is not an unusual height for like Greek giants, like Achilles, for example. But, and so Og would have been somewhere 12 to 15 feet tall, probably more like 13 to 14 based on the bed size. But he's not as tall as Gilgamesh is. So Gilgamesh, and in the Ugaritic text, they're all the same dimensions. Um, and so you have civilizations that seemingly don't communicate 
writing about the same tale almost word, word for word with the same dimensions. And that dimension is 11 cubits tall and 4 cubits wide. That's his height and, and width. So on a royal cubit, that's about 19 feet tall and 7 feet wide. You know, those depictions of him holding those lions, you know what I mean? And I've even had people on the yeah. internet, you know, say, oh, well, you know, they, they just made him out to be larger than life. Or maybe that was a, a, a lion cub. I'm like, look, that, that lion has a full mane. Uh, yeah. He's holding that thing like a cat. Yeah. They, you know, people have been brainwashed that the people who lived before us in generations were stupid. And there is no difference between us and them. And I would make an argument as you go further back into history, they have more knowledge than we do yeah, today. We're just rediscovering all their stuff and putting new nuances to it. Yeah. Yeah, we can't build what they built um, before the flood. And that knowledge, you know, uh, was passed on after the flood, or at least parts of that knowledge was. So we're just catching up to that. And that's why it's important to understand that the days of Noah is an overarching mm -hmm. sign. Noah lived 600 years before the flood and 350 years after the earth. Yeah, 350 years after the flood. And um, you have giants on both sides of the flood. And we need to understand that that's part of what we, what we need to be aware of going into the end time, that understanding. However you want to say giants are going to influence the end time through bloodlines, recreation or demonic spirits or all the above, they're going to have an impact and we need to understand that. That's why people can't imagine what's going to happen. So you have, the, have, the, have this giant that is absolutely enormous compared to other giants after the flood. Unless that is an antediluvian dimension, right? So we have to also qualify that. But he's described um, as being like that after the flood. So, and he was, he's held in such high regard in all the other ancient cultures that there, there's going to be something to this. Um, and I have no reason to believe that they couldn't measure because they were building ziggurats and stuff like that. Yeah, so they, they had geometry. They understood the dimensions they were doing. They had geometry, yeah. So it's important, it's important to, to, to understand that you know, we're no smarter than our ancestors. And they've seen stuff in a lot of cases that we can't even imagine.